we're interested in is um, exploring what the experience of actually assembling a robot, what the effect that has on your later experience with the robot. So we have our subjects come in and just take around 10 minutes to put together all of these parts. So, you know, maybe they feel a bit of a sense of extension of the self into the robot. So what we do is after subjects um, build the robot, we um, take the robot away and say we're giving them a different one um, in some conditions. And in other conditions, they actually use the one that they built. Um, the thinking there is that even if it's the idea identical robot, the exact one that they built, just that experience of assembling it is going to result in kind of an extension of the sense of self. So what's this? Now we're on to the second part. Yeah, so now we go to the second stage. So what we do here actually is we um, hook you up with the oh, physiological okay. sensors. And then what follows is basically a game that's kind of similar to um, Minesweeper. Minesweeper. So what you're going to do is you are going to position Oops your robot um, in the center square, uh -huh. and you can point it in whatever direction you want. Okay, this is the, this being the center square, mm -hmm. okay. You can point it in whatever direction you want, and you're gonna aim for the points that you can see in the squares around it. There he goes. Oh, it looks like you're on a bomb, so. I think I'm on a bomb. And then we look at what your physiological um, indicators are. So um, we've done it with self-reports, which very consistently show that if you've built this robot, then you're going to respond very differently than if you're building, if you're operating the robot that you actually built, but you think somebody else built. Where does this research lead us? It has important implications for a couple areas of human-robot interaction. So one would be search and rescue. So in lots of cases, you want people to feel an extension of themselves into the robots, but not in every case. In really high-stakes situations like search and rescue, operators are under crazy stress trying to guide this robot through, say, a, a minefield. And in that case, um, we don't want them to suffer the physiological consequences of feeling like really this... Like being scared. Yeah, they exactly. Don't wanna... They don't want to have this, you know, this constant feeling like they themselves are going through a minefield. So here we are with a Robo Sapien by Wowie, um, a standard toy that you can get anywhere pretty much that we have converted here to use for some studies. We've cut its vocals and um, stuck a walkie-talkie on the back so that we can get sound out of it. Um, basically, we're interested in seeing what happens when you have a robot that needs to disagree with you. Um, in a case like, say, maybe moon colonization, where um, a robot is helping you um, uh, weld or do something like that, and the robot knows better than you and wants to dis disagree with your opinion. <laughs> Disagreeing with us, shooting him right now. <laughs> Basically, the setup that we have here is um, a desert survival task. It's ba basically a ranking of items to see which you would want if you were stranded in the desert. And the um, robot is going to disagree with your <laughs> suggestion. So say you say a flashlight is the most important thing that you would want out in the desert. Um, this guy disagrees and says that he actually thinks the pistol is a better choice. So why do we want to know uh, how, to, how to make ourselves respond better to our own robots? Sure. Well, I mean, as robots are getting more and more capable, they may have information and knowledge that's superior to our own. In a case like that, it's pretty offensive for a robot to disagree with you. You can just imagine your natural response would be not to accept Stupid the advice. Robot. Exactly. So we're trying to explore ways that you can have that robot communicate the information without the person really hating the robot. In this case, we actually deal with the distancing. So you know sometimes if you're criticizing somebody, you might say, um, one might say that this performance that we've seen is not so great. So you're distancing yourself from the negative right. comment. Here we're actually physically distancing the voice. So in one condition, we have the voice coming out here, but we've also done it where we have his voice coming from this control box. And what we find is that that physical distancing of the voice makes people like the robot more when it's disagreeing with them. I would like to hear the robot disagree with me. Yeah, you disagree with me. <laughs> Let's see. So I'm telling him to go forward. Well, maybe he doesn't want the to. The knife could be helpful in cutting down stakes to build shelter. That is not as good as the pistol, which could be good for signaling for help. <laughs> which do you choose? And you find that if it comes out of here, people are more likely to agree with the robot? 
Um, yeah, well, we find that people like the robot more when it disagrees. Okay. So, but do they make the choice that he recommends more often? People make that choice more often when he disagrees. So in the case where the robot says, you know, you, you first select the flashlight, and he says actually the pistol is better, um, in that case, people are more likely to change their answer to the pistol when they have their second chance to make their priorities um, than if the, ro the robot had agreed with their initial choice. Thank you.